Welcome to the Ninja Tune Podcast with myself, DK. And today I'm talking to Ash Kusha about his new album, I, a.k.a. I. His early years growing up in Iran, studying at the Tehran Conservatory of Music, and of course, some of the music that has influenced him over the years. After that, we look ahead to some of the new releases coming out on the Ninja Tune family of labels. Once again, we're here at Ninja Tune HQ, uh, this time in the company of Iranian-born and London-based producer Ash Kusha, whose album I, a.k.a. I, is coming out on Ninja Tune. Welcome along. Thanks for having me. Your last album, Good, had some, uh, had some great reactions from the likes of Pitchfork, in fact. Did that have a, a positive effect on the making of this album, or did it kind of make it more daunting? I was actually in, in in the process of making it while all of those stuff was happening. So, but it also, yeah, it, it definitely um, it gave me some sort of positive energy <laughs> to to carry on doing the crazy things. Because most of the time I do stuff and I just put them somewhere, hide them in the computer because I think people are gonna um, ignore it or something. I don't know. But yeah, it's. It's it's been it's been really good. I think it's it, it had a really positive effect. And did you? I mean, no one can really expect too much. But did, were you hopeful or expecting the, the, those kind of reactions you got for uh, good? I mean, uh, the album itself, the the set of songs, the tracks, they were kind of important to me because I I, I was experimenting this new method. So. I wasn't actually thinking about any reactions or anything. It was just a laboratory that was running, and I was just trying to put the put the thoughts in, in sounds, basically. So yeah, it was kind of unexpected as well. process with this album much different to what you were doing on the previous um i wouldn't say it's different it's the way i make music is i i'm i'm, I'm always prepared in terms of uh, the methods i use so at the moment when i love someone or hate someone or think about something i just sit down and just make some sounds and can you tell us a bit more about this laboratory this process that you're because you you know you are you're making some incredible sounds and how how do you go about it 
Um, so I started playing instruments a long time ago. Uh, when I was younger, I, I tried different instruments. I was playing um, a lot of bass, bass guitar, jazz bass, improv, Im improvs. And throughout time, I tried modular synths, um, tried different synthesizers, softwares. But then my studio kind of shrinked into one computer. It kind of, I minimized the, the, the amount of tools and equipment. And that's because I wanted to reduce the, 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 the process in terms of time, timing. Mm, not, not to make it like take too long to, to execute one emotion into sound, to translate emotions to sound. So yeah, it's, it's, it's mostly digitally done and it's based on rec recorded sound and my sound archive basically, which is the hard disk. And on, on this album, which track, you, you say you're trying to cut down the process for each track. Wait, was there any tracks that you were struggling with that were more complex than others for you? Um, I would say the, um, the track Beautiful for me was, was kind of the strangest one because I was, I was trying to uh, make one of the, the lead line basically to talk as if it's, it's a singer with, with no lyrics basically but it's it's as if the synthesizer is talking it was difficult because I I, I didn't do it before so it was, it was kind of new I was struggling with the sound a bit point you get if you are struggling with a track that you just shelve it and move on I mean the process is I mean for me is interesting because it, I I record something and then I mix it a bit and then I close it down and next day I listen to it if it works it works if it doesn't it's gone you also have a lot of stunning images and visuals to uh, accompany your music so is that something that's really important to you the visual aspect um, yes, because I feel like I, I recognize sound as objects more than just audio. I, I try to see sound, I, I, I basically see sound. Um, I try to treat them as sound objects, I try to um, work around decorating them in a room, which is the, the empty um, logic project basically that I use. So yeah, visuals. I, I try to be very specific with the with the uh, visuals, and uh, hence the collage style of the artworks that I use uh, work with this um, artist. And yeah, it's, I think the visual aspect to this kind of music is important. Am I right? You you're doing some work with Oculus Rift headsets, and your album is your album going to be available through that? Yeah, I'm developing uh, 20 minutes of the album on the Oculus Rift and. It's going to be uh, an experience, uh, a narrative that where you can experience sound as objects. So you can you you see everything uh, as audio responsive uh, objects in an environment, in a visual environment. In I mean, in simple words, you're you're going to be inside the music, inside the head of the composer. Well, let's pause here then, and maybe we can have a listen. You, you brought in a few tracks. Um. There's one that I always listen to, and I mean, I've been listening to this like forever. It's um, uh, I'm Happy uh, by Jim O'Rourke, and that's that's the one that I've always gone back to, and still I, I listened to it yesterday for like two hours. So, yeah. That's, um, and it's because the layers, each time I listen to it, the layers are just expanding. 
I don't know, there's something with this track that you never remember a phrase from this track and it's always new and that's really fascinating I think when you have this kind of piece that it's it's not it's, a, it's not a musical piece it's an environment it's an audio environment I would say Okay, now I'd like to know a little bit more about you know your early years growing up in Tehran. Uh, I know you sort of travelled to Frankfurt as well, is that right, through your dad's work. But what music was sort of seeping into your consciousness at this time, at an early age? What were your family listening to? What were you hearing? I remember my mom and dad, they, they used to listen to a lot of cheesy stuff, actually. Yeah, a lot of Genesis. <laughs> But also, I remember a lot of craft work, and it, yeah, it's it, that's that's where I, I I remember electronic sounds, digital com- computerized sounds. So yeah, that was in that period. There was a lot of because uh, it was in in the late 80s, 90s kind of thing. And was this was that available in Tehran, or was that through? traveling to Frankfurt yeah it was limited it was limited when you were in I mean after the war in Iran there was a there was a limit to the limited access to music because you you had you had to wait for um, people to bring tapes and copy tapes from Europe or elsewhere and bring it in and you could copy it and it was mostly tapes and um, yeah some records definitely from from the uh, before the revolution and yeah, there was there was limited access. You 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 had to get lucky to to end up like listening to either Backstreet Boys or Pink Floyd.
So um, what else was your source of music at this time? Before the internet, it was all uh, black market tape people like selling you compilations and yeah, random albums. So you would buy all of them to get like a couple of good records, yeah. Um, but yeah, post internet, it was just, it, we we just went nuts with the with the pirating. Yeah, we just we basically downloaded the whole whole <laughs> internet. Let's stop again for another track from your selection you brought in. The second one is the tango by uh, Zbigniew Preisner, if I'm yeah pronouncing that right. Um, and it's from the film uh, White. It's the soundtrack to uh, the movie White. And this one goes way back when I was 18. So it has this really special place in my head. Um, and the amount of passion and in, in the, in the strings that he's written is just, yeah, it's, it's almost as you're, you're disconnecting from this world by this music and yeah going higher and higher every time you listen to this music it's just amazing studied at the Tehran Conservatory of Music. How was that for your sort of musical development? Was it a forward-thinking place or was it more traditional? I mean, more important than anything, it was seeing other musicians and playing with them every day. Different bands, different instruments. And that made me understand music, musical elements from different angles and different aspects of uh, the genres from classical Iranian to uh, European classical music and jazz and blues. Yeah, it was, especially the first year, it was crazy. It was, everyone was just picking an instrument, jamming. So yeah, it was, it, it, it was really exciting. But then I got into the musical theory and the, the, the composition, the, the counterpoint I was really interested in. And yeah, it, it kind of structured my head to, to a, uh, to a good extent, not not too much, but yeah, because I was a I was an absolute improv guy, just pick up something and make some noise. But then it structured me to a good limit. But did they? Was it? Were you encouraged to improv? Was it? Was it that the environment that they want you to try out different things, different styles? Um, yeah, I think it was because you're um, you don't get a lot of places where you can jam with random people it's either your local group or the underground band you have in Iran so this was interesting because I I, I, I could meet up with different mentalities in music and it, sometimes it was actually super weird because you, you, you would get three it was a, a duel kind of thing 
three uh, traditional Iranian instruments against three jazz musicians. It was like, rrr, rrr. yeah, some sort of battle for for one hour. I remember once we we jammed for one hour, nonstop. I was like on a solo for one hour. <laughs> so yeah, that was mental. It it kind of improved our improv skills and how to we we learned how to create phrases and react to one another to sound to instruments and so what was the what led you to kind of take your path down electronic music the only thing that was missing when i was in that school was electronic music so that's why it kind of pushed me uh when i was at home i was kind of pushed into learning how to use the computer how to record sound because there's a limited number of producers in Iran that actually use computers and produce. Nowadays, it's I mean, back then, uh, you, you couldn't find anyone who, who, who does electronic music in Iran. So I try. I, I was trying to make records actually to record stuff, and I didn't have any equipment, so I learned how to use the devices and softwares. I started with Cool Edit Pro, uh, and. It's funny because I still believe that's, that's one of the best softwares ever made. It's really basic, but it has some some crazy plugins that I don't know why Logic or Ableton they don't make it anymore. It's like the the noise reduction um, plugin, and also there was this option where you could click your mouse, you, you could select the waveform, and anywhere. You, you, you could click anywhere on the spectrum and you, you could get one sample so you could make the best glitch album ever yeah it was crazy so that was the start of where you that are was now the start, yeah and i also had a microphone like this uh recording sound from anywhere i could yeah and then trying to sample them with drums and taking like i would put mp3s from uh some jazz records and some yeah whatever I could put in the software really. and take the drums out put some sounds in really basic sampling and were you playing this to other people yeah I mean I back then I was like really shy I was uh, I wasn't sure because it wasn't too popular you know it was like who's this crazy guy and then I showed it in a, in a, in a conference kind of thing at the music school and the the guy who was uh, running the conference, he, he called me out from the audience. He's like, come here. Whose music is that? He played it on a, on a, a CD player and he's like, you see this guy? He's making new stuff. This is new music. I was like, oh. this is melancholia. I, I never forget this phrase. Like this, He's melancholic. Be melancholic and make music. Not necessarily, uh, I don't know, but yeah, yeah, that was that was fun. And then after that, I tried to develop, uh, getting a better computer was the first step, and developing the methods and, and trying to incorporate more of the instruments, maybe uh, experimenting, basically. Yeah. So, what was what was the f sort of first piece of electronic music that caught you? I mean, you mentioned craft work growing up, but it was was there anything else around that time that that kind of caught your attention and you? just encouraging you to delve into this world yeah it was actually i was watching mtv when i was a kid in the 90s and come to daddy yeah that was yeah. apex yeah it was crazy yeah i mean it's one of those things that you're like what the fuck what is this yeah and then i realized oh that's that's a lot of like effects and there, there's a lot of different equipment involved and techniques and stuff. But I couldn't understand it when I was younger, but then I yeah, started to, start to do, learn more about it. Yeah. Well, let, let's take another break, actually. Let's uh, listen to another track you brought in. Um, so this next one is um, Vaca. It's Untitled One uh, by Sigouros from the, the Untitled record, which is one of my favorite records of all time. And if I'm left on a planet alone, I'm gonna listen to this forever. I'm just gonna put it there in the background. It's it's just ma magical. This tune is the chord sequence could be run forever on any instrument. 
and the, the main chord sequence for me is is one of the most amazing cycles of notes and yeah it's it's, it's amazing So you, you mentioned before actually about being a bass player, um, you, and you were the bass player in the band called Font, which had some issues playing live in Tehran, and I uh, understand resulted in three weeks in jail following an underground gig. Did that have an effect on your musical path? Did it? I mean, did it make you more determined? Did it make you want to give up? Did it, what was? It was just an unfortunate event, to be honest. It's, it was just a pause in what we were trying to achieve. All the effort was just gone because after that, most of the band members and most of the people who were encouraged to do this kind of stuff, they just left. They just tried to uh, not be involved as much. So, but after that, I, I just kept doing what I could do because it was the only thing I, I put my um, entire youth on. It basically, I was like. Yeah, I was in. Yeah, this is it. This is, I, yeah, I've gone to prison, but what can I do? Like, Obviously, presumably not a big club scene, or sort of everything was underground and in. Yeah, in back then numbers. it was crazy. It was just you. You had gigs with 15, 20 people, because you, you, we, we couldn't get any uh, permits uh, for public events and stuff like that. And so, were there a lot of these? small gigs going on whether there are a lot of people doing it but just in small numbers yeah yeah in small numbers and very private the problem with this one was that it wasn't as private it ended up being like one of those huge out of control parties but yeah I'm sure if you put that party here you would get arrested <laughs>
Your next band, uh, Take It Easy Hospital, with your friend Nigar Shakahagi, that led to an invitation to play at a Manchester festival. Um, and at the same time, you appeared in a film, No One Knows About Persian Cats, which won an award in Cannes. Um, can you tell us more about that period? So how did how did you end up in the film? And uh, was it do- was it a kind of a, like a documentary, or was it actually a film? It was uh, they call it a docudrama. It's, yeah, so so some of it is real, some of it is fictional. So yeah, um, it was right after the prison. I when I came out, I met Nagar, and we decided to start this project, which was very influenced by uh, New Order and and 80s bands. Um, We were just experimenting, discovering new things, and then we got invited by MySpace to um, to In The City Festival in Manchester. And yeah, and right, right before we wanted to leave Iran for the mini tour, we kind of contacted people and we, we, we set up some gigs. Right before that, we met this director and he um, yeah he, he was struggling with with the permits and uh, the government didn't let let him do his film to shoot his film and he was yeah he was kind of depressed as well and he he thought let's make a film without a permit about music with no permit I was like yeah right <laughs> So we, we started writing ideas and the stories, and it just happened. And we left, and a couple of months later, it was picked by a Cannes Festival, and it won the jury prize. And yeah, that's it was a bit of a turn. <laughs> that seems a crazy period that you've you know you've gone from doing stuff in a band to. I mean, would you call yourself an, an actor at that point? Yeah, cause, yeah, because I was acting actually, but I was acting a version of myself that is slightly more calm and it's right out of prison like straight out of jail <laughs> it's depressed and it's, yeah but it was yeah it was a great experience so and then so did you did you go to manchester and do this festival yeah we did the gig at um this place i don't remember the name but it was really cool yeah we we did a um i was playing an organ a 70s organ and we we had like playback beats on the laptop yeah it was fun it was fun as take it easy hospital you did a a, a remix of angels by the xx was that that's a bootleg we didn't mention that but that was that was just uh, yeah i'm sure they people are gonna be like where did you get the vocals and stuff but yeah yeah it's funny they didn't sue us or anything (laughs) so do you know if they heard it you know did you get any reaction from no You also did a remix for Ultra Neuve and uh, Empress of last year. So, it, I mean, is your process with remixes much different from just your own productions? Um, not really, because I uh, treat remixes as recompositions, reproductions. Basically, I don't use sounds from. Uh, sometimes I say it's it's not necessary to send me stems because I I want to recreate that music. Um, so it's not a remix kind of it's like a remake mm. kind of thing but it's called a remix anyway yeah so it's kind of the same process except there's a vocal line I use the vocal line and create another track basically. like an in the
let's stop again for another track out of your five. Um, what's your next track? Sun's Gone Dim by John Johnson. This one is just epic. It's, it's a big track. First of all, it's it, the vocals is as if a robot is singing. It's, it's a machine. There's there's the feeling that the the machine has a has a, has emotions, and that that's very interesting for me. The first time I listened to this track, I was really really stunned by, um, I was shocked that this voice is so robotic but still so emotional. And then the music goes on, and then there's the climax, and I was like almost crying. I was like, oh, what happened? Almost exploded. Um, yeah, at the end, there's the singer that goes super high with the notes, and yeah, it's it's amazing. It's a really big track. in the UK for a few years now um, can you tell us what it's like living in the UK it's got probably your first time coming over here was it when you yeah came from seven years ago um, and how does it how does it affect your music making when I came here I was listening to um, uh, Untrue by Burial and and it was fun because that music is London it's so it kind of pinned London in my head I understood it like whoa this is this audiovisual experience of London and um, the good thing about the city I think it's that everyone is everyone is trying to make make something 
that is pushing our species to to the next levels I would say in, in different stuff not even just in music it's, it's in so many different aspects I, I go to talks in, in universities and conferences and you learn so much because you get a lot of people from different places and different different angles perspectives that's really important for me to to be in a place like that I think yeah um, you you did a mix for Solid Steel last year do you DJ out at all do you share music with others that you're into I don't DJ much but yeah I really like to so I, 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 I always share music with friends and say like this is this is so cool and this is yeah but um, but also I like combining things that are not meant to work together necessarily like f folk music and gabber let's say so they they could actually meet at some point I think and sound amazing recently completed your own film for Marta so are there more films in the pipeline what another extension of the visual side and you're doing the music for it I presume as well yeah, uh, yeah I do the soundtracks um, for Marta was my first experience as a filmmaker I tried to uh, make uh, a collage film an experimental film that uh, projects my my thoughts about life and death and after this I'm I'm aiming to um, work on film at least make make a film every two years or a year even and uh, at the moment I'm working on uh, three s different scripts and see which one is realistic for the second film for the next film so you got one more um, track you brought in with us yeah um, this track from Sakamoto is it's amazing um, for me personally it's it's been put on one of my favorite scenes in cinema ever from the film Babel uh, by Inia Ritu and it's it's amazing because it the whole film is so intense emotionally but this 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 piece of music it calms everything down and it's it's as if it's all right at the end it's you're fine it's it's fine it's this is life with, with all the craziness the parallel stories that happens at the end it's just life and and yeah the girl is staring out, out from a balcony and it's i remember that scene every time i listen to this yeah and i, I mean the in terms of composition it's very unique as well i think it it, it works every time i put it on yeah
So with the, the changes happening in Iran, are you hopeful to return at some point? It was, it was It's funny because when, when I was thinking about music, I always thought that I'm going to travel the world, make music, and, and end up doing what I do. But it seemed that it's not in the real world, it's not something. You, you, we, we were not privileged to do that. So hopefully one day we're privileged to live in Iran and just do music and travel around and yeah, be, be connected, you know, it's, it's important, but yeah, maybe. So what are your plans for this year? Have you got any live dates? Are you, what what would, would you do live? Yeah, a couple of shows are coming, um, starting from March in Convergence Festival. Um, I'll be playing the first show as an audiovisual set, uh, having, um, it's, it's a short set, but I'm, I'm going to do visuals on that show but uh, I'm, I'm developing a, a virtual reality tool for live music so hopefully this summer and um, after that I'm going to try experiencing that tool actually live so I'm, I'm going to be playing with virtual reality headset and and see how it works for the audience yeah. so everyone wearing a headset. oh no it's actually <laughs> I'm going to be the one who's wearing this. <laughs> you just watch. <laughs> just watching you and enjoy the experience. <laughs> but uh, there, there are going to be points that you, you, uh, the audience see the, the, the visuals from what I do. But I think for me, because I'm, I'm a bit of a... I, my, I feel like I make music, I'm composing, and I want, want to be in my own shows in a way. So if I'm on the stage, I wanna I wanna be in the, in the studio. It's just as if I'm in my own studio and also there. So it's yeah. That sounds great, I'm, and I'm sure we'll all enjoy it. Well, um, I think that's about it. So um, thanks very much for, for coming in. And uh, I, aka I, is out on uh, Ninja Tune. <laughs> Thank you.
that was Ash Kusha in conversation and now we turn our attention to just some of the new releases coming out on the Ninja Tune family of labels starting off with none other than the mighty Roots Maneuver with his track Crying remixed by Hyperdubs Code 9 Trying to tell me I'm brown Trying to tell me don't do this Trying to tell me I lost my way Trying to tell me it's foolish Trying to tell me about life itself when none of you people know me When the life I seem to be cut short Death don't go so slowly When you see life like I lose Ain't no wonder I'm a user It's no excuse when I keep myself elusive I got good uses to keep myself exclusive Never take it personal when I don't return your call When it keeps in this world on favours And I just can't do them all yeah. Damn right, that's the life I choose If you're a friend indeed, then it won't be news for you I'm crying for the day I'm crying for the day yeah. Can't say why, but I'm crying for the day I'm crying for the day I'm crying for the day yeah. That's how I feel, I'm just crying for the day Crying for the day, I'm crying for the day yeah. I let it out, I'm just crying for the day Crying for the day, I'm crying for the day yeah. I'm crying for the day That was Crying by Roots Maneuver, remixed by Code 9 And that's coming out on Big Daddy Next we head over to Brain Feeder and new signing James Zoo With his track Flake <laughs> That was Flake by James Zoo, taken from the forthcoming album Fall, coming out on Brain Feeder. Now a classic Bonobo DJ edit of Henri Texier finally getting a vinyl pressing on Ninja Tune for Record Store Day 2016. the Bonobo remix of Leila Ba by Henri Texier. Next, we feature Max Graef and Glenn Astro teaming up together with a track called The Yardwork Simulator coming out on Ninja Tune. Oh, 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 
was Max Grafe and Glenn Astro with the Yardwork Simulator from their forthcoming album of the same name. Finally, it's a track from Mojiek Karalak called Discopus No. 1, Part 1 and 2, which is taken from the If Music Presents You Need This, Eastern European Sounds, 1970-1986, which is also out for Record Store Day 2016. Wojek Karalak from the If Music compilation out on Record Store Day. That's it for this edition. My thanks once again to Ash Kusha for the interview and we'll be back once again for another Ninja Tune podcast soon. 